Sister Mary Liu, NTUC President, Brother Ng Chi Meng, Secretary General, Brother Robert Yap, President of SNEF, brothers and sisters at home or also from overseas, a very good morning to all of you. I'm delighted to be here for your NTUC National Delegates Conference. I've been attending National Delegates, Delegates Conference for about 20 years. <laughs> the last time I was at one was in 2015, the SG50 year. And this year's conference is also special because it marks the 50th anniversary of the 1969 Modernization Seminar, which was a pivotal moment for both the NTUC and also for the People's Action Party. The PAP and the NTUC have been partners from the very beginning, even before they were born. The founders of the PAP began their political lives in the unions. In 1952, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, as a young lawyer, represented the Postal and Telecommunications Uniform Staff Union in the postman strike. He won a good settlement for the postman and went on to become legal advisor to countless other trade unions. That same year, Dr. Go Keng Sui set up a council of joint action for all government unions and associations to demand equal pay for local civil servants, the same as their expatriate colleagues. Two years later, Mr. Lee launched the PAP to fight for independence from the British. Several unionists were among the founding members. The trade unions were right in the middle of the anti-colonial struggle. Originally, they started as traditional unions, British staff, advocating better working conditions for workers, and from time to time calling strikes and industrial action. In Singapore, you may not know, but when people say industrial action, they really mean industrial inaction. That means nothing is happening, but it shows that you're angry. And there was a lot to be angry about in the 1950s. So inevitably, the unions were drawn into the wider political movement for self-determination, independence, merdeka. The PAP made common cause with the unions. And we also made common cause with the left-wing Chinese-educated activists who were already in the unions with established strong positions. In fact, they controlled many of the trade unions in Middle Road. And many of these activists were deeply influenced by China and by the communist victory in China in 1949. Some had direct links with the communists, and they used the unions as a front to promote the communist cause. So after Singapore achieved self-government in 1959, and then the struggle turned between the non-communists and the pro-communists in the PAP, the unions became one arena of political struggle between the two sides. In 1961, the Barisan Socialists split from the PAP, and the trade union movement also split. And the pro-communist side took most of the trade unions. So the non-communists had to form the NTUC to stand with the PAP against the pro-communist Barisan Satu group. So the PAP and the labor movement have been intertwined, twins, from the very start. At first, the unions and the PAP were partners in the anti-colonial struggle. Later, the PAP and the NTUC were partners in the fight against the pro-communists. But after merger, we entered Malaysia, and then separation, and we became independent. We had won both these struggles. The colonialists were gone. The communists had been defeated. What's the next battle? The NTUC drifted. Its old political role had diminished. It was uncertain what its mission now was and how it should now function. So union membership came down sharply 
In four years, from 65, when we became independent, to 69, when we had the modernization seminar, the membership came down by a quarter. But there was no lack of new challenges to come. In 1967, the British announced that they would withdraw their troops east of Suez, including, including closing their military bases in Singapore. It was a cold shower for us. We faced the prospect of suddenly losing 14% of our GDP and more than 20,000 jobs. What do you do? It was a crisis. The PAP leadership was clear what needed to be done. We pursued industrialization aggressively to grow manufacturing businesses, set up factories, create jobs. But this would only succeed if we made ourselves attractive to foreign investments, because a government cannot build the factories. What will it make? Whom will it sell to? Where is the technology? Who is going to run the companies? So we had to bring in investments, foreign investments, multinationals. At that time, the conventional wisdom was that multinationals exploit third world countries like Singapore. So Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, come, welcome to Singapore, please exploit us. Because if you exploit us, you give our workers jobs and we will learn and we will prosper. But we had to make it attractive for them to come to Singapore and give them confidence that they can invest here and make money and do well. So we passed the Industrial Relations Amendment Act to give employers the right to hire, promote and fire employees unilaterally without first having to consult the unions. We also introduced the Employment Act to standardise and regulate the terms and conditions of employment for all workers and eliminate bad work practices left over from the colonial era. These legislative changes the unions didn't welcome because they significantly curtail the bargaining power of the unions. So not surprisingly, the unions found them difficult to accept. But given a choice between adapting to the new realities and becoming irrelevant, the unions made a sensible decision. As Devon Nair, who was then only an advisor to the NTUC, he said then, the labour movement was caught in a race between modernisation and extinction. Either you change, become up to date, become relevant, play a useful role, or you carry on with your old model, old thinking, old actions, and you become extinct. And this was the genesis of the Modernization Seminar 50 years ago. The Modernization Seminar was NTUC's response to the challenges it was facing, and it was the moment when NTUC decided to change course and to chart out a new future. That was the turning point. Three key PAP leaders spoke at the seminar, Lee Kuan Yew, Go Keng Sui, and S. Rajaratnam. The three key people all came. It was a very important meeting. They spoke frankly to the delegates. They laid out the harsh realities facing Singapore. They argued and persuaded the unions that they had to take a broader perspective when looking after workers' interests. Not narrowly defined, just this year's wage increase or job security locked into this job cannot be adjusted, cannot be changed, cannot be separated. But instead of that, a more holistic goal to help workers achieve a better standard of living, better homes, better schools, better hospitals, and a healthier environment and a brighter future for their children. Then, if we can do that and more jobs are created and there's less unemployment, over time, wages also will go up. And they also reassured the unionists that they had an important role in transforming Singapore into a modern industrial economy and building an independent and united nation. It was a very challenging agenda. But by the end of the seminar, a new compact had been forged between the leaderships on both sides, between the political leaders and the 
union leaders. And all 47 NTUC-affiliated unions declared that they accepted full responsibility, co-equally with government and management, for the survival of Singapore in the crucial years ahead and for its continued and expanding economic development and modernization. So that was the new mission statement. Full responsibility together with the government and management. That means tripartism. And what was that? For the prosperity of Singapore in the crucial years ahead and for Singapore's continued economic development and modernization. And indeed, these were crucial years for Singapore. They were the years we took off. And this was the turning point when the unions came on board and started making it happen. The NTUC was no longer just an institution for collective bargaining. It saw itself as a partner in Singapore's economic and social transformation. And this led to the unique tripartite partnership, which has underpinned half a century of harmonious industrial relations. As part of its new mission, NTUC expanded its role into the social sphere. It set up cooperatives like Income and Fair Price. In those days, it was not yet called Fair Price, but I think it was called Welcome, but it became Fair Price. And so the NTUC set up businesses to provide life insurance to workers and necessities like food and groceries at affordable prices to workers and to their families. And later on, with the government's help, it created Orchid Country Club and NTUC Downtown East so that rank-and-file union members could enjoy recreation and entertainment facilities just like their bosses. And so when NTUC holds celebrations, you come to Orchid Country Club down here, it could be any country club in Singapore. And so the PAP and NTUC entered the second stage of their partnership as partners in Singapore's journey from third world to first. Harmonious industrial relations came about and it catalyzed investments and jobs. We not only survived, we thrived, we took off spectacularly. Our industrialization drive succeeded beyond our wildest imagination. We leapfrogged the region and linked up with the world. And Singapore was well on the journey from third world to first. Workers' wages and standards of living rose quickly, and we had decades of high growth. But it wasn't all smooth sailing, because during these decades of high growth, we also went through several very serious downturns, even frightening downturns. 1985, we had a sharp recession. 1997, we had the Asian financial crisis. 2008, we had the global financial crisis. Many of you have experienced these things personally. These were the formative moments in your lives. Each time, tripartite relations were severely tested because workers are under stress, employers are under stress, government is under pressure. What do we do? Do we pull apart? or do we hang together? And luckily, each time we tackle the problems together, we pull through and we emerge, we emerge stronger and more united. In these downturns, the government had to take difficult and painful decisions, such as cutting CPF rates. Harder still, ministers had to convince union leaders that these steps were unavoidable. And hardest of all, the PAP and the union leaders then had to persuade Singaporeans and workers to accept the bitter medicine. By then, the founding leaders who had fought together in those tumultuous early years had handed over to younger successors. Or in 95, in 85, the first sharp recession, were preparing to hand over. And they said, here you are. I think this is a good training exercise for the young people. But it was a live firing exercise. No duff. 
and we were dealing with real problems with workers' lives, workers' jobs, and we had to meet them face to face. It was before we built Orchid Country Club. So we met downtown at NTUC at a conference hall and met meetings of them, one after the other. I remember I was there with, at that time, Comrade Ong Ping Chong, who was Secretary General. And we had to face them, explain to them, defend what we wanted to do. Finally, cajole, persuade, convince the union leaders that this is the right thing to do, there's no choice, let's persuade the workers, which we did. Through these crises, younger leaders were battle-tested, they earned credibility and trust, and so we renewed the close bonds between the PAP and NTUC from the first generation into succeeding generations. These bonds between the PAP and the NTUC have to be sustained and strengthened. Once again, we are sailing into uncharted waters. The world is filled with uncertainties. Our economy is entering a new phase. Technology is transforming many industries. Emerging businesses are disrupting established players. Our workers have to be ready for change. And we have to talk about it, we have to understand it, and we have to say, I'm ready to face it. Every May Day, every time I speak to a union audience, I try to look for a different way to make this same fundamental point. And I look for many examples, but one example which I come back to again and again is PSA's example, because it's so important to the economy and it shows us so many different aspects of the challenge which we have to face and of how a successful industry is keeping itself up to date and successful. So let me come back to PSA once more and tell you something new which you may not know about them. We are building a new port in Tuas. It's going to be a mega port. And recently, two weeks ago, I visited them. They had an event from Tanjung Paga to Tuas, and they ran a relay, some running, some on the boat, some on the AGVs, or soon-to-be AGVs on their trucks bring a torch relay from the old to the new. We are going to move there by 2027. And PSA and MPA showed videos of what it will be like and of their living labs where they are experimenting with new technology. And among the ideas which they are trying out are unmanned automatic guided vehicles, AGVs, moving around in the container yards, remotely controlled, nobody driving and key cranes with remote operators. No longer do you have to climb up so many stories and steps to go to the top of the key crane in order to look down, in order to manipulate the containers. You have to bring your lunch with you, you have to bring your toilet break with you. But now you've got, you can operate remotely, more conveniently, we hope more efficiently. New technologies, but also new skills. And it's not far away. Akan datang, next change. It's coming imminently. Other ports are already using these technologies, like in Shanghai. And our port workers will have to learn these new skills, new routines, different jobs. And once they do this, they too can become more productive and share the efficiency gains. The port workers have gone through this before. But many other industries are also going through this same transition. So we have to help our workers handle the transition properly, train them for new roles, teach them how to cope with the rapid changes, remain employable, hold their hands, give them confidence. We can make it together. It won't be easy, but we will walk with you every step of the way. In many countries, it's not like that. When workers lose their jobs, they are left to fend for themselves. Other workers still in their jobs, many of them, they haven't been retrenched, but they feel left behind by progress. They feel their own lives don't seem to be improving. And the masses are angry that the elites in the country, their leaders, 
seem disconnected, seem to be only looking after themselves. And worse than people feel we are being looked down upon. And the social compact, that trust, that mutual reliance has been fractured. And so people are angry, they just want to tear the system down because it's no longer working for them. What comes after that? Don't know. Will it be better? No idea. But I'm angry, I want to tear this down, I don't care whether that will make things better. And that's why populist movements are growing in many countries. In America, as a presidential candidate, Donald Trump sensed this angry mood, championed this group, and he won enough votes to become president. In Britain, the Brexit campaign mobilized people who felt left out by globalization. And this campaign has exacerbated the fault lines and deeply divided the British people. It will take them many, many years, more than a generation, to come back and become one nation again. In France, Emmanuel Macron won a close presidential election, defeating the right-wing party candidate Marie Le Pen. Because the French have the same ground pressures which led to the right-wing group gaining support, but not quite enough to win, but the unhappiness was still there. So Macron became president, then he raised diesel taxes last year, and then it triggered violent and sustained demonstrations by the Yellow Vest. Same reason, people who felt left behind looked down upon. These are all far away, but in the last few months there has been an example closer to home. Everyone has been watching closely the demonstrations in Hong Kong and the riots in Hong Kong. There's clearly deep and, un and widespread unhappiness in Hong Kong society. It's not a minority, it's millions of people who are feeling aggrieved. And their most vocal complaints are political ones. How one country, two systems is working out, how Hong Kong chooses its political leaders and governs itself. But underlying this is also the sense that serious economic and social concerns have not been addressed in Hong Kong. Housing is very expensive. It's very difficult to start families and to have children. And the younger generation are not optimistic about their future, no matter how hard they may study or work. And so, they are in a very troubled situation now. Singapore's situation is quite different from Hong Kong's, but we should study closely what's happening in all these other places, including Hong Kong, and ask ourselves, can this deep social angst happen here? Can this social division befall us? And my answer is, yes, it can, if we are not careful. Singapore is not immune to the underlying divisive forces that are tearing at these other countries. We are exposed to the world. We are globalized more than them. We are vulnerable because we are smaller than them. And we, have, we feel the same forces, and we have to resist it better than them. If it happens to us, like this, what's happening elsewhere, we will suffer the same consequences as the other countries, only worse because we are that much more vulnerable. And then it will become impossible to govern Singapore, to make and carry out difficult decisions, or to plan for the long-term good of the nation. Nobody will think about Tuas 2028, or Singapore in 2050, or your grandchildren, because next week, next month, even next year, will seem so far away. Confidence in Singapore will be destroyed, and I think Singapore will be finished. How do we avoid this dire outcome? And one key foundation is a symbiotic relationship between the PAP and the NTUC. 
Because of this symbiotic relationship, we already have a government that represents the workers' interests, and that is the PAP government. The PAP will always remain close to its roots in the labour movement. That's why many PAP MPs come from the NTUC, and that's why in Cabinet, the Secretary General sits as a full minister. Your DSG also takes part in Cabinet meetings as an SMS, and they both speak up for workers when policies are made. Sometimes when policies are not yet made, they put their hands up and ask also. The PAP's fundamental objective is to advance the well-being and the future of our workers. And that's why the PAP government, we build affordable homes for families. We deliver high-quality health care to young and old. We make good preschools and schools available to every infant and child. And we ensure that, public, that the public transport system is reliable, efficient, affordable to all. Most of all, the PAP government creates jobs and opportunities for our workers to enable every citizen to improve their own lives through their own efforts, provide for their families and themselves and their futures with confidence and pride. And this is far better than having a populist government that gives vent to the frustrations of the population or panders to the short-term passions at the expense of our long-term interests. On its part, the labour movement has participated as equal and constructive partners to create prosperity and growth. As Dr Goh wrote in his foreword to the report on the modernisation seminar all those years ago, the labour movement has understood that it's only when there's growth and prosperity that its members can get the improvements they want. Workers have enjoyed a fair share of the fruits of your efforts. You have influence and interest within the system. You don't have to go outside it, work around it, or worse, try to pull it down and replace it. This is your system. Make it succeed and take pride in it. The PAP is working with you, for you, for Singapore. And that's how we've worked together and prospered ever since the modernization seminar. Of course, in half a century, the world has changed many times. NTUC has been progressive and forward-looking under successive secretaries general, from Brother Devan Nair all the way now to Brother Nchi Ming. We invited the previous SecGens to come today, but many of them are overseas. But I'm very happy to see Brother Lim Tion here with us today. Welcome, Tion. <clears throat> today, NTUC continues to rethink your role to keep yourselves up to date and relevant to the changing needs of workers. You're pushing hard to continuously reskill and upgrade your members to help older workers to work longer and stay active. You are growing union membership, diversifying your representation. You are bringing more workers into the NTUC family. And you're expanding your social enterprises, whether it's my first school, food fair, fair price, or NTUC health. In all these ways, NTUC and its social enterprises continue to make a difference to the lives of workers. To assure workers, you are not alone. As you make your way forward in an uncertain world, a strong NTUC will help you, guide you, walk with you. This is how we can stay united and progress together. Fifty years ago, our pioneer leaders promised to keep Singaporean workers at the centre of our economic and social development efforts. And generations of PAP leaders and union leaders have worked closely together to deliver on this objective. And this promise remains as central and as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. So today, the PAP government renews our commitment to you 
we will always stand with workers, ensure your well-being. We will always do our best to help you and your children progress with Singapore and have a better life. And we'll ensure that no Singaporean, regardless of family background or life circumstances, will ever be shut out from opportunities or left behind. At this conference, you will be electing the NTUC Central Committee. As Sister Mary Liu told you just now, the elections will be tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm confident that you will choose good leaders who will serve you capably and well. Leaders who will develop deep roots among workers, understand your needs and concerns, identify with you, speak up for you, and at the same time, leaders who can help you to see the national perspective and persuade you to support policies which will benefit you in the long term. And that has to be so in the NTUC. It also has to be so in the PAP. And that's how they can lead you, advance your interests, secure your jobs and futures for many more years to come. Thank you very much.